Thailand says it's concerned about the situation in Myanmar after the military junta lost control of a strategically important town on the Thai border. The army has withdrawn from the trading hub of Miawari after days of fighting with resistance forces. There's been a steady stream of people trying to flee the country. It's the latest setback for Myanmar's military regime, which is facing growing opposition from rebel forces and a sharp drop in support among the people. At the Thai border, arrivals from Myanmar are up by almost 50 percent. Burmese here are crossing over from the town of Mayawadi after fighting between the military and armed groups. Are villagers afraid of the situation? The Burmese people felt terrified, so they moved to Maesot. Do you still feel scared? Yes, I do. Mm. There's no fighting at the moment? Yes, not in Miawadi town. This Thai border check is a short ride from where Myanmar's military government has been pushed back by rebel groups. They've been clashing near constantly since October, when the rebels got together in a union of fighters to form a larger opposition force. It's a sign of the ruling juntas eroding power and popularity. They're also at odds with civilians for deposing Myanmar's democratically elected government run by Aung San Suu Kyi in 2021. To be here in a house. Displacement and conflict have been widespread since, drawing criticism from the UN. 2.8 million people have now been displaced, 90 percent of them since the military takeover. Many of these people require urgent access to food, shelter and safety. The junta risks losing additional credibility for a strategic loss of Mayawadi, a major trading point that links Myanmar to Bangkok by highway. Rebel attacks on the military and civilians are on the rise, and Thai forces can no longer rely on the junta to secure the Myanmar side of the border. Well, Christopher Gunnis is executive director of the Myanmar Accountability Project, a group helping to build criminal cases against the regime. I asked him if the junta is losing its grip on power. It very definitely is. And to understand what's going on, you need to go back to the 27th of October last year, when an alliance in the north, in a large area near the Chinese border, took control with Chinese support, not overt support, but certainly um, China's complicity, if you like. And that has spread rapidly to other border areas near India, Bangladesh, um, and now in Thailand, where the loss of Miawadi is a significant blow because a million, a billion rather, with a B, a dollar's worth of aid went through um, from Myanmar in to Thailand. In addition, we've seen a coordinated attack, a drone attack on Napierdor, the capital, just a few days ago. And there are increasing reports that the number two in the junta was injured in a drone attack. So although I think there are real problems with the um, cohesion of the rebel or the um, armed opposition groups, because they are many, um, I think it's very true to say that there have been significant setbacks for the junta, certainly with Miawadi, but really since last October. And you mentioned China there. Uh, could pressure from the international community on Beijing uh, change things? I think China is very angry with what's happened in Myanmar. They had a very good relationship with Aung San Suu Kyi. They saw her, for whatever reasons they decided, for as a, as a cause of stability. And the coup against her and her ministers and her government did not go down well in Beijing. And the, the big thing to understand here is that China has mega projects, highways, um, all sorts of infrastructural projects. And all they want to see in Myanmar is stability. And the one thing we've not seen since the coup um, on the 1st of February 2021 is stability. So, yes, the Chinese role is absolutely central. And as I say, it was the Chinese role which allowed um, this military action to be so successful um, in the north. And what one of the reasons for that is that the Myanmar junta was allowing huge scam centers, which Beijing thoroughly disapproved of, to take hold. So, yes, I think pressure 
on China to intervene more forcefully might work, but I, I don't see the Chinese ceding to that kind of pressure mm -hmm. um, at all. But certainly, I think what we're seeing is a divided international community at the Security Council meeting just a few days ago, Russia and China clearly pitted against the Western delegations. And I think that division is being very skillfully exploited by the junta. What we want to see is a ban on aviation fuel, because with these military setbacks in the battlefield, what the junta are doing in response is aerial attacks. There have been a number of, of, of horrendous attacks um, in Arakan State and Rakhine State up in the north. Um, in particular, it's, be, it's very bloody. And the other thing to say is that in the last few um, months, the junta has been implementing a forced conscription policy, which I think, again, is a signal of how desperate they are. They're literally conscripting um, men to fight for, um, for three years. Doctors, for example, also um, military doctors, uh, there's forced conscription. And again, I think this is a sign of desperation. And I think the international community, led by China, needs to step up and make clear a clear political program to stabilize what's happening inside Myanmar. Well, let's bring in Elaine Person. She is the Director of Human Rights Watch Asia Division and joins us from Bangkok. Elaine, we're hearing about more and more border towns in Myanmar that the government no longer controls. Is the junta losing its grip on power? Well, yes, I mean, it certainly seems that way. I mean, the loss of Miawadi town um, is a major blow to the Myanmar military. I mean, this is a very strategic uh, border point. There are six uh, border controls between Thailand and Myanmar. This is probably the most important one. A lot of trade goes through Miawadi. And, you know, this is coming after a series of defeats that uh, the Myanmar military has faced on various areas of the periphery, uh, whether it's in Rakhine State, the border with Bangladesh and India, or on the border of Thailand, and even to the north, there's been very fierce fighting. So I think we see that the Myanmar military is really under a lot of pressure. They've introduced a conscription law. Um, this war is not popular, and it really feels like they are losing uh, this battle. You mentioned uh, conscription there. Your organisation says that the military is now forcing Rohingya men and boys to fight for it. Tell us what you've been hearing. Yes, that's right. We put out a release earlier this week where we documented about a thousand Rohingya men and boys have been abducted. They've been rounded up in Rakhine State and they're being forced to fight on the front lines. Now, the ethnic Rohingya are not even allowed citizenship in Myanmar and they have fled to Bangladesh because of campaigns of ethnic cleansing and acts of genocide by the Myanmar military. So it's really sickening to see they are now being forced to fight for a military that committed such atrocities against them. Uh, they've been picked up in nighttime raids, boys as young as 15 years old, they're promised money, they're promised sacks of rice, but they also don't really have an opportunity to refuse this fighting. So this is really concerning, but I think it also shows the extent to which, you know, the Myanmar military has been forced into this position because of the heavy losses on the battlefield. Well, in our report, we've seen accused of people fleeing Myanmar for Thailand. Tell us more about the humanitarian situation. Well, that's right. I mean, we've seen uh, more than 100,000 people uh, leave over the past three years uh, since the coup. And now I think there are concerns about what the counteroffensive will look like. Uh, we've seen in the past uh, airstrikes that have resulted in very heavy civilian losses. So I think it's really important that the Thai government keeps that border open, that it allows people to flee, and that it doesn't force people back into harm's way. And certainly we've seen some positive steps by the Thai government in that respect, a commitment to allow um, you know, 100,000 uh, people from Myanmar to, to come to Thailand. But we want to see concerned governments in the region also step up um, and also offer support to Thailand and we don't want to see anyone being forced back uh, to Myanmar, particularly right now when we're seeing, um, you know, these atrocities happening on multiple fronts, you know, all across the country. Now, the United Nations says poverty rates are soaring in Myanmar and that the middle class is collapsing. That's always a bad sign. What are your sources telling you? 
Well, that's right. I mean, the UN had a new report out this week, uh, which just showed the economic devastation uh, that the military junta has um, put the country under over the past three years since the coup. So, you know, the middle class is really halved. You have nearly half of the population of Myanmar living below the poverty line. You've also seen a lot of people fleeing to other countries, fleeing the fighting, but also looking for economic opportunities and recognizing that, you know, those opportunities just simply don't exist uh, in the country. So, you know, I think for people of Myanmar, you know, not only is there the risk of war, of atrocities, um, of airstrikes in certain parts of the country, but even the economic desperation is causing people to flee and seek uh, opportunities elsewhere. Thank you very much, Elaine Pearson from Human Rights Watch, Asia Division. Thank you.